Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today at this exclusive digital roundtable titled Risk Management Using Intelligent Data Protection and Compliance Solutions. It's designed for healthcare leaders just like yourselves. My name is Jonathan Tallett. I'm the Senior Research Manager for IT Services for Sub-Saharan Africa at IDC. So on behalf of Glasshouse and IDC, very happy to welcome all of you today. Let's keep this interactive today. Uh, you're welcome to post questions as we go along uh, in the in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll try to tackle uh, as many of them as we can when we get to the open discussion section uh, or offline if necessary, but we'll try to answer uh, all of the questions if we can. Uh, you're also welcome to uh, to tweet about the event, share, uh, share your, uh, your experiences on social media. Uh, but to start things off, uh, I'm going to take a few moments, uh, share some data with you uh, around aligning security uh, and transforming business expectations based on research that IDC has conducted uh, in, uh, in this region and in, in the broader region uh, across Metro and across Europe as well, to give you an idea of the feedback that we're getting from the market uh, specific to uh, the life sciences and healthcare fields where there are some uh, some really important uh, differences which uh, make the industry particularly challenge, challenging. So to start off, uh, let's take a look just very quickly at the backdrop to 2022. It, we know where we've been for the last two years. That's not a, that's not a big secret, um, but a lot of the pressures had already been building. There were already a lot of pressures on uh, tightly stretched supply chains. There's been a great deal of focus on uh, changes in the regulatory and compliance frameworks that are uh, that are in place. Tremendous focus on business agility, on uh, the ability to uh, take advantage of new opportunities and new markets, leveraging new technologies. Uh, in the, the healthcare sector, tremendous amount of focus in the capabilities in AI and analytics, for example, but also right across the um, the manufacturing and supply chain with. IoT and, and lot provenance and so on. So a lot of a lot of innovation happening uh, as well. And really, what COVID did was put a, a great deal of spotlight on the the capabilities that were going to make a, a short term uh, impact. Uh, and now the questions are starting to turn to how we leverage that going forward. So, for example, there has been a tremendous amount of investment in international data sharing platforms for. Uh, for uh, for infection data, a lot of the groundwork for that was already in place. There were uh, many existing networks uh, already there. We just kicked it up a, uh, into a higher gear and, and de de developed new capabilities. How we leverage that going forwards is uh, very much an open question. So there are uh, there are challenges in the the market right now, but there are also opportunities, and not least of those is uh, in cybersecurity and risk where uh, there are uh, very high risks facing uh, folks like yourselves, um, where the impact of uh, incidents now is significantly higher than it has been in the past. The, the rate of incidents is, uh, is still uh, very high. And, and there are uh, very direct financial uh, implications to, uh, to attacks as well. So we'll talk more about those in detail as we go along. One of the things that we know is that uh, when we look at the, the healthcare market in particular, and this, this data is, is meta-wide, so this is looking at um, uh, healthcare organizations across the Middle East, uh, Turkey, and right across Africa, um, we know that security tends to emerge as a, a, a slightly higher priority than it does for, for other organizations. Um, that's not a big surprise given the level of risk. One of the interesting phenomena within the, the uh, sub-Saharan Africa area in particular is that you tend to see quite a high showing for physical security uh, on this chart as well, which is kind of a, a local market tax, if you like. There's a lot of additional money that is being spent on providing physical security of facilities and supply chains, logistics, and so on, which uh, is effectively a cost of business and it factors into uh, profitability effectively and it does have to be taken into account. When we look at big data and analytics, there's not a significant difference between organizations of all sorts and, and the healthcare industry where there is a big spike is in AI. Uh, a tremendous amount of focus going into uh, AI, machine learning, um, and, and there are all of the related cognitive intelligence, uh, cognitive computing fields. The IDC's forecast for that is, is that by the end of this year, nearly a third of global life, global life sciences organizations will have uh, some form of data excellence in place, AI, 
supporting direct collaboration between human and machine processes. And that will translate into very measurable impacts on productivity and profitability. Uh, and that will start to uh, create a, a performance gap of those organizations pulling away from their peers. That's the kind of uh, gap that will compound over time. So uh, very, very important to watch that space closely. On the flip side, uh, within this region, comparatively less focus going into uh, areas such as robotic process automation, um, IoT, workforce transformation. And these are areas where if you look globally, the healthcare industry doesn't lag. So there again, there's a, a potential area where this market is, is showing signs of, uh, of potentially falling behind. Uh, if those investments start to bear fruit for those organizations and technologies like RPA tend to uh, tend to map directly to efficiency gains, uh, then there could be uh, then there could be implications there as well. So that's also a, a space that we're watching carefully. Right at the top of the list of concerns for pretty much everybody is uh, operational efficiency, looking for cost savings, looking for ways to um, just to make the organization that little bit more resilient uh, as we, we're coming through this, uh, the market downturn and the, the crisis that we've had. Uh, areas where you will see a, a key difference between healthcare and the, and the other industries is the business reorganization tends to be far more front of mind for, uh, for healthcare. Uh, and in that, you will really see the need for integrated data platforms, bridging those silos within the organizations. You can't undergo deep rooted organizational transformation without having those data platforms in place. And with data platforms comes the need for data security as well. So that, that'll lead us to the, the security conversation that we'll have a, a, in a short while. On the flip side, product innovation tends to be far higher in other industries where they're constantly looking for, uh, for new sources of revenue, new products to bring to market. Um, that's typically where uh, you'll see a lot of the, the analytics focus in those organizations coming through, less of a priority in healthcare. But when we look at, at cybersecurity, and this is, this is looking at um, uh, Europe, rather than meta specifically, and this is looking at, at the, the healthcare sector within that, we know that um, cybersecurity is, is a tremendous concern. It emerges uh, very, very high. There you can see right at the bottom of the chart, so this is in Europe, physical security scoring much lower than it does in, um, in local markets. Um, the, the risks to mitigate, when you look at compliance, it seems to score relatively low. It's not that it's not getting attention, it's that it's uh, it's not perceived as a as a specific risk. Uh, and that's an area where uh, it moves up and down depending on the uh, the rate of change of regulations, especially in the life sciences field where we're talking about quite long term projects in, 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 for example, in pharmaceuticals, where a change in regulation may happen in the middle of a product cycle. Uh, and that can have a, a big effect. Uh, changes in privacy legislation, which have been happening across sub-Saharan Africa, uh, have had an impact on that because it, uh, it impacts re the research processes as well. So th there absolutely are concerns there where you will see uh, peaks and troughs depending on, on where you are. Uh, but for the most part, consistently, uh, the message that we get from this vertical is that um, security and risk absolutely uh, top, of the, top of the concerns and that they're addressing on a, a daily basis. When we look at how that's actually manifesting, so what the uh, what the actual um, the business expectations in terms of security are, the KPIs that are being put in place to measure IT security, what you'll see uh, very strongly in the healthcare field, and this is looking again specifically at Meta uh, now rather than Europe, um, mean time to detect far more uh, emphasised in this vertical than it is uh, in others. Again, reflecting that. Uh, that greater focus, that greater scrutiny on the uh, on risk and the impact on the business. And this is very healthy. Uh, that increased focus on mean time to detect allows for that very accelerated response. Uh, it allows for potential breaches to be identified and contained before they can spread. Uh, we're gonna talk about ransomware a little bit later. Uh, and, and that's an area where your, your time to detect and your time to respond are absolutely critical. Every, every second counts. Uh, I would say that focusing on time to detect at the expense of other capabilities is a, is a mistake that some organizations make. 
especially when they're looking at emerging technologies where um, the there aren't the established security best practices. We've seen this coming through, for example, in, in cloud and IoT, where it takes time for some of those security best practices to catch up. Uh, detecting the anomaly is really only half of the challenge. Uh, it's taking action after it, containing it, mitigating it, um, and then responding to regulatory authorities uh, as needed. But that is, uh, it is a healthy picture. Um, and we'll talk about incident response times during the discussion later. So, uh, so let's hold that thought. So when we, when we put all of this together uh, into really the kind of the key takeaways that, uh, that we share with customers in the, in the life sciences uh, space, the pharmaceuticals, healthcare, and, and the like, um, the first is that digital transformation is almost certainly a reality in, in your business in one form or another. Uh, data integrity is utterly essential within that. Uh, you, can't, you can't gloss over it. You can't cut any corners. Uh, and in particular, if you're in, a, in a, uh, an organization which is going through that internal transformation, a business transformation, uh, the, the data platform will be uh, extremely important. AI and, and analytics uh, is emerging as a key competitive differentiator. Very important to have that uh, on your strategic roadmap. Um, targeting those improvements uh, in business KPIs. Uh, this is not a hypothetical technology. It's not, um, it's not science fiction. Uh, it very much should be tied to business outcomes, measurable increases in uh, efficiency, productivity, and, and profitability. Look for uh, multiple sources of data. So for example, in, in, the, in the healthcare field, we're seeing a tremendous amount of focus now on um, on combining real-world data, uh, real-world evidence with, uh, with R&D data and, and leveraging that, using that for deep learning and using that for, uh, for business value. So that's absolutely a trend which is building at the moment. And then uh, really focus on the integration and integrity of application silos and application lines within your business. Um, look, for, look for ways to automate, look for ways to... Um, to squeeze out efficiency, uh, not just internally, but where it applies to external partners as well. So right across supply chains where uh, it can be harder to integrate, but it absolutely is worth doing and leaning on technology to, uh, to achieve that, especially in, in markets like Sub-Sahara where uh, there isn't as broad a, a market available. So strengthening the relationships with the uh, supply chain partners that you have is, is extremely important our risk of, uh, of supply chain disruption is comparatively higher. So that, that's it in a nutshell for me, just uh, uh, some very quick high level uh, thoughts on where we're at in, uh, uh, in this market. Uh, if you have any, any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to, uh, to post them uh, in the chat and we'll, we'll get to those later. Uh, but uh, for now, uh, thank you very much. And I am gonna move on now to, uh, to invite uh, uh, Zahir Hanif, uh, so here is the data protection and cyber resilience specialist at Dell Technologies. So here we'll be uh, presenting some insights on protecting your business, starting with protecting your data. Uh, so here I'll hand over to you. Thank you, thank you, John. Can you hear me clearly, John? Just to confirm. Yep, loud and clear. Perfect. Thank you so much. So uh, hi everyone. My name is Zahir. I'm a data protection specialist uh, for Dell Technology, uh, specializing in cyber recovery in the enterprise space. And uh, I'll be talking to you guys about, you know, uh, protecting your data and, uh, and your business. So that will be the key focus. And please, any questions, please drop it in the chat as uh, John mentioned. So if we just look at, uh, you know, South Africa itself and uh, where it stands in against the world uh, from a cyber attack perspective, we're in the top five. So the landscape around, uh, you know, cyber threats is changing. Uh, these days, uh, ransomware is sophisticated attacks very much based on digital extortion, providing state-sponsored uh, cyber terror, threatening to expose organizations' sensitive data across the internet. We've seen that similarly with ShopRite earlier in June uh, this month. The modern threat of uh, cyber attacks um, and the importance around uh, maintaining the confidentiality, availability, and the integrity of uh, data requires a modern solution and strategies to protect vital data of all systems. In fact, if we look at, and I, you know, from a healthcare perspective, a global giant like Merck 
experienced um, you know, a cyber attack that cost them over a billion dollars in, in revenue loss, right? And to avoid paying the damages, the insurers considered um, the attack as a, a act of war. Earlier uh, this year, uh, Mark warned that battle, uh, you know, providing that it wasn't an act of war, this was a cyber attack. And that was in favor of the courts to Mark itself. In an annual report, Merck suffered significant financial loss as the illicit software spread through thousands of uh, the company's computers as a result disrupting world operation, including manufacturing, research, and sales operations. So you can just understand, you know, despite the billions of, uh, you know, dollars being spent on uh, different postures within the organization, uh, data protection solutions, and according to over a thousand uh, IT decision makers, 69% of them still lack the confidence of the organization to recover business critical applications after a cyber attack. That's a huge gap left in the traditional data protection solutions and services that uh, weren't designed for modern uh, threats in uh, cyber criminals uh, post today. As uh, you know, and, and, and that's where the stakes has shown that in a data-driven world, these reasons for a cyber resilience is on top of mind, board level discussions, and at every CTO, CISO, and IT director's table to ensure that the right infrastructure is put in place to avoid reputational and financial loss. So if we just go a bit down from the South African layer straight into healthcare, and we look at where healthcare plays in against the different sectors in, uh, uh, in organizations. Ransomware, uh, ransomware attacks have doubled since uh, 2020, uh, in 2021 by 34%, so it increased to 66%. 61% of those organizations actually pay the ransomware uh, to get the encrypted data back compared uh, to an average uh, global, uh, global average around 46%. Less data is recovered after paying the ransomware. And we can see specifically in healthcare, only about 65 to 70% of their data is recoverable after uh, you know, the, the encryption has been taken. High cost in recovery of uh, the ransomware incidents, long recovery times for uh, after a ransomware attack, and only 44% of healthcare organizations that suffer an attack uh, will recover their data most probably after one to two weeks, and 25% of that will even push into a month or two months thereafter. Low cyber insurance coverage in healthcare, 78% um, of cyber insurance uh, coverage compared to the global average, about 83%. So cyber insurance drives better cyber defenses. 97% uh, of healthcare organizations that have uh, cyber insurance have the, have upgraded their cyber defenses to improve the insurance positioning. So let's play out a real, a real life uh, example. Um, so normal daily operations, um, everyone's applications in IT is actually working. And the next minute you get this notification that you know you have to follow these instructions that your data has been encrypted, and with uh, you know quite uh, direct. Uh, indications of, you know, do not rename, do not uh, actually change, or do not get assistance from third parties. This is extortion on all levels. And as you work through, um, work through a daily operations, uh, and you later find out that, you know, data has been encrypted, uh, your servers have been encrypted, storage has been encrypted, and you move down that into your DR protocols, your backup server, and your backup data. At that point, you have to ask yourself, you know, what do we do? And being in a war room scenario at this point, we look at each other and saying, you know, what do we have in place? Do we have clean copies? Can we recover? Uh, you know, do we have a clean room? How do we get out of this attack? And I can just imagine the pressure that's felt in from everyone in IT, security and compliance to bring back that data or to recover out of an attack. So, from an enterprise perspective, we would actually see a lot of customers uh, that we're presenting cyber solutions to has uh, the, you know, the overlap between 
you know, we have a disaster recovery. Why do we need a cyber, you know, a cyber recovery landing space or isolated environment? Because DR can do that capabilities. As you can see on the screen in front of you, we are very much uh, involved by taking the categories from a DR perspective. And if you look at a cyber recovery perspective, and you, you know, we work, we work together. It's not seen in separate silos. They overlap. They ensure that uh, resilience is put into the organization. And if you look at the key factors of that environment is, you know, natural disaster versus uh, a sof sophisticated attack, ensuring that, you know, quick recovery times, uh, how quick did it spread? How quick can we get our data back? How clean is our data? And this is important that we have to provide our customers that uh, ability to do so. So I see there's a question in the group, Diren. Um, is there a reason why our cyber insurance covers our this facility and if that's a consumer therapy? So then what we'll do is I'll, I'll definitely take the, the questions after uh, the session and then uh, just see to it, or if Rudolf can just answer them in uh, the chat. So if you look at our postures that we have today running within organizations, um, and we have to rethink of our approach of how do we protect our environment? How do we bring this together? And uh, how do we ensure that the data is recoverable, right? So if you look at your standard size, uh, it would be backup plans, antivirus, and uh, from an encryption perspective, uh, you know, can you protect, you know, uh, does that stop you from while your data is encrypted to uh, in a ransomware attack? Uh, from a recovery perspective, you know, my DR protocols versus my data that's on tape and how do I get that data back and my RPOs and RTOs behind that and your recovery plans. And then from a cyber insurance perspective, you know, this it does not protect you against uh, outages or long-term effects. So, you know, we have to just rethink and and what is required for your organization and how do we bring it back? So if you look at uh, what from a uh, cloud technology perspective, how do we bring this together and how do we transform the security from a, a, a protect and recover aspect? We believe in the three I's. So isolation, immutability, and intelligence. Isolation, having a physical and logical separation of your data moving away from your operational uh, daily operations and having uh, a data uh, separated away from your network uh, in an isolated vault. Preserve the original integrity of your data by having immutable or non, uh, won't be able to change your data. And then providing that intelligence that's in the vault that will be able to provide machine learning and to identify any threats uh, within the vault itself. So if you look at the characteristics on um, what's required for the cyber vault, the systems are isolated and secured. So disconnected from the network, hardened so that no unauthorized access can be provided uh, into the vault, so a, a vaulted environment, ensuring that the proper security protocols are put in place. When we move across into the, the system itself, you want an, one technology that's locked, immutable. Immutable is a buzzword that we get on different uh, silos within infrastructure itself, but you wanna make sure that it's not just immutable, but indestructible. So if your data is indestructible in the sense of not getting to it or changing or manipulating that data, even if you have admin rights, that is hardening down the capabilities and security process within the vault itself. Then we move on to process integri uh, uh, um, integrity and uh, forensics. So having a full scan, so this is a proactive measure, where we have a full scan of all the critical applications that come within the vault itself. We were able to scan their data sets and the structure within that data, apply those threat uh, intrusions to it, see if there's any changes within your file structure. Um, you know, simple things as, you know, deletion uh, where, you know, file servers like data is reduced or um, increase of data uh, or change of extension files. And this will be able to be using the machine learning and scanning that data sets continuously within the vault offline away from the operational, the daily operations. So how do we, how do we provide this? 
with our partnership with uh, Glasshouse itself and the services that uh, uh, they can provide is a complete solution, right? It's not just uh, cyber recovery, but it's bringing your data protection storage, your reporting, your run books, and your processes all together. We develop, uh, Glasshouse will be able to deliver a 24 by seven uh, protection with a support team certified by Dell Technology, and that could be at the customer's choice, right? It could be uh, infrastructure living in your DC, it could be in cloud, AWS, as, and, and in Azure, and they can do that for many services from that perspective. So coming towards the end of it, you know, how do we uh, and Glasshouse bring this together to in five simple steps? So the first step would be identifying your most critical applications, uh, making sure those applications are protected, having discussions with internal to your business organization. So consulting with you, you know, what are the main critical applications that you require? Once we have step one down and embedded, we actually move on to the next step, which is the design process. So we tailor design the cyber, cyber recovery solution based on your hardware, software, and your services to meet your business objectives. Then we take those designs and we actually put the deployment and configuration for the right solution that fits your organization. And the fourth step, we provide the operational aspect to make sure that the environment is set up according to the design and processes to ensure that we meet that uh, governance and compliance. And then the fifth step is about the response. How do we respond to an attack, providing the proper processes and also the run books that is uh, included if an attack has to occur. So just to recap from um, a tailored made solution, it's as easy as five step. We identify this and provide our customers the ability to design a solution, to deploy it, operationalize it, and then respond into an attack. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. From my side, protecting your data starts right now. Thank you so much. I haven't told you, John. Excellent. Uh, Zia, thank you so much for those insights uh, and the slightly scary statistics, but I think that that very much reflects the, the reality for, uh, for organizations. Um, you're no longer a, a weird outlier if you've had a, a ransomware incident, you're very much joining the majority and uh, um, there, there's less of a stigma now about organizations um, being upfront about um, the, the incident and the, the impact and of course they're all regulatory. Uh, requirements and disclosure as well. So all of that is kind of creating this, I guess, a greater sense of awareness uh, and concern uh, and having solutions on the table to uh, to mitigate it uh, is, is super important. So with that in mind, uh, now I have the pleasure to invite Rudolf Fasaki to present. Rudolf is the solutions architect uh, at Glasshouse and he's going to share some best practices with us. Rudolf, over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to take this, the time this morning to discuss with you the best practices and building blocks that's required for a cyber solution. Um, the first part of it, I'll be looking at the essentials that makes up a proper cyber vault or cyber recovery solution. And then what is the next steps that we can take to even make that vault work for us and even protect us better. Um, please, as we go through these sections, stop me if you want to discuss or have any questions and let's make an interactive session. So first off, we need to start with a vault that is a secure copy of your data. And this vault must be physically and operationally separated from your production network via an air gap. And I cannot stress enough how physically and operationally this must be separated. Physically means that once the data is copied into this vault, your golden copy must be safe there and no one must be able to access it either via the network or physically. So security into this vault is very important. Um, security that someone cannot walk up to the cabinet where this vault is actually situated. There must be multi-factor authentication, not just from an IT point of view, but also physical security. And that makes sure that we have a copy of our data that is separate, that is untouchable. Because we know that when there's a cyber attack, the chances are that these criminals have been in your network for more than six months, looking around, lurking, finding out how everything fits together. So securing it, separating it, and making sure that they can't touch it is one of the essential building blocks and best practices of a cyber vault. Next up, we must have a vault copy that is pretty much up to date. It doesn't help us to create a copy and that copy 
ages, by two weeks, months maybe. If there's a cyber attack, we need to recover as quickly as possible and we need to recover with data that is up to date so that it has a minimum business impact on our environment. And the way to do this is by making sure that these replications or copying of data into this vault is an automated procedure that is controlled from within the vault so that once again we do not have that so that once again we have a separation and no one can actually access this vault from the outside. The next step is that the data in this vault must be immutable. So to ensure that our golden copy is safe for use, the copy in the vault must be immutable and it must be immutable in line of the regulatory standards out there. Um, there are a few um, standards that's been set up by some international standards bodies that says how data must be protected and must be immutable. So having your data in your vault immutable also helps us to ensure that data isn't accidentally deleted inside the vault or if by somehow a attacker do gain access to our vault that he cannot access or change that data at all. And of course, we must make sure that the malware should not be able to execute inside that vault. Remember that we're taking a backup or a golden copy of our backup data, which means this is production data being copied into the vault. So if an attacker has gained access to the environment for a few months prior and started copying the data, uh, these malware software around, we are going to back that up and we are going to replicate that into our vault. So we must make sure that if we have that data in there or those application or executables in there, that there's no way for this malware to execute and actually damage our golden copy. So these four is the basic building blocks of best practices on how to build a cyber recovery solution that is safe and will help us to recover. But let's take it that one step further. Let's look at what we can do additionally to help us protect us. And this is the ability to scan that golden copy for malware. As I just said on the previous slide that because the data that we're copying in there is a copy of our operational backups, um, the chances are that if there's any except malware in there, that it will be in our vault as well. So we need that ability to scan those that data to identify this um, malware and immediately report and flag on what's going on. But because our, our vault needs to be separated from the network and so on, we must use a way to scan this without needing to update any databases by regularly connecting to the internet or anything like that. And that's where the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning comes in. The vault copy, we must have the ability to find our last good copy of data within this vault. So while we're now scanning using artificial intelligence and machine learning, and we do find that some of our data has been compromised, we must have an ability to pinpoint us to tell us when would we last have a good clean copy of this data in our vault. And how then, and that we can, should we, in case we need to recover, quickly jump to that point in time. So we don't have to waste time going through backup catalogs and trying to find out which system or which version of the data we need to recover. We must have the ability to quickly find the last good copy of the data. The vault needs to contain more than just a golden copy of our backups. And I think this is one of the things that people tend to overlook in when looking at a cyber recovery solution. A lot of people think, yes, let's get a copy of our backups in there. Let's make sure it's immutable, it's separate from our network, and that it's safe. But what about the other information that you require in there? What about software that you need to deploy if you need to start rebuilding your systems? What about encryption keys, certificates, configuration files? And I'm talking here basic stuff like switch configurations, Active Directory certificates, um, all of that type of information. So during the glass house, identifying what to put into this vault. We're not just looking at your backups, but we're also looking at what else needs to be in that golden copy of your vault. And then of last, the last but not least, the vault should comply to international standards. And these standards govern everything from the fact that it's a physical air gap from your production network to the type of immutability that we apply inside the vault. All of these standards are adhered to. And one of these standards, which the Dell solution adheres to is the sheltered harbor Alliance um, standards, which actually govern, covers all of the things that I've mentioned about physical separation, immutability, finding good copies quickly, and then the fact that you know that you will be able to recover from a cyber incident when, well, God forbid, this happens to us. And that's the end of my best practices for, in, for building a cyber recovery solution. If there's any questions, please share with us.
Excellent. Uh, Rudolf, thanks. Thanks so much. You make it sound so easy. Um, <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course, it's often, uh, often the things which are, are easiest to describe in, uh, um, as key objectives, it can be the hardest to, uh, to actually put into, into effect. So, uh, uh, folks, we're going to move into a, a, an open discussion uh, very shortly, where we'll pick up uh, questions which have been raised in the uh, in the Q and A box. There have been a few that have come through already, so uh, so we'll be uh, we'll be tackling those as, as well as um, as well as any others. First, though, uh, I'd like to um, I'd like to ask the audience a few questions. We have a poll which I would really appreciate you taking a few moments to um, to go through and just give us your answers. Uh, and we'll we'll use some of the some of the feedback from that uh, in the in the open discussion as well to to have a look at, at what some of the um, what some of the real world impact on on uh, all of you has been. So uh, so from the top, first of all, asking about uh, your experiences conducting a, a disaster recovery exercise, and if so, what you achieved. Um, of course, the, the the need to do DL simulations on a, a regular basis is. is is very clear. I'm sure most of us do it to uh, to some degree or another. Um, whether they're successful, of course, is is really a key question. So uh, so please do let us know if uh, if you've done one, and if so, um, whether you felt that it would have been a, a full recovery or only a partial recovery. I'm interested to know if you have a a third party backup provider that you're using. So uh, please let us know uh, if you are or, uh, or you're not. It'd be very interesting to see what the what the split looks like. Uh, this is an area where uh, from IDC side, one of the one of the areas that we track is the the growth of um, as a service consumption of technology. So we've seen quite a lot of uh, increased interest in um, uh, in third party sort of as a service solutions. That doesn't just extend to backups, of course, it extends to all all types of enterprise IT, uh, and the cloud is is absolutely a part of that. So uh, so let us know um, if you're using solutions in that space. Um, and then uh, just type a few words if you would let us know uh, what media you're currently using to to back up your data. Um, a lot of a lot of people uh, do have legacy applications and they they're quite frequently using uh, legacy backup media um, on the principle that it's in you know it's in place and uh, and you don't want to disrupt it. So let let us know uh, what you're using there. Uh, and then lastly, just coming back to that stat that you saw uh, during the uh, during the um, Zahir slides. Um, 61% of companies that have been hit with ransomware pay the ransom. I'm curious to know what you think the main reason is for that, uh, whether you feel it's primarily to prevent data loss or whether it's primarily to prevent that uh, that, rep that reputational damage, uh, which is which would be your top answer. Obviously, in, in reality, the answer is going to be sort of some of some of the one and, and some of the other, but which is which to your mind is the most important. Uh, so let us let us know what the uh, uh, what you think, and, and then we'll move straight from this uh, into a uh, into an open discussion, and, and we'll chat about some of those uh, some of those as well. So I'll give you just a, a few moments more to uh, to answer the poll, uh, and then we'll we'll move on. Um, as I said, we have had a, a number of questions that have uh, that have come through. So I, I think um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to kick off with with some of those actually, uh, and uh, invite Rudolf to uh, to maybe share the answer that he shared in the in the chat. Maybe to elaborate on it a little bit for uh, for everyone who who hasn't seen the question, uh, and to uh, perhaps talk through some of the complexities that we see here in the the cyber insurance space. So the question was, uh, why is uh, why is the cyber insurance coverage in healthcare specifically on the low side? Is it because of uh, low cyber defense maturity? Um, and th there's obviously a lot to unpack within what cyber insurance capabilities uh, are available to you, what uh, what the limitations are, um, and it will vary a lot from from one customer to the next. But Rudolf, uh, you you kind of gave a, an, an outline there of what some of the uh, some of the, the key considerations are. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on that for for other folks in terms of what they uh, what they should be looking for uh, in cyber insurance, where the uh, what they'll get out of it, what they won't get out of it. Thanks, yeah. The thing is that with insurance, as with any insurance out there, whether it's your personal insurance on your car or business insurance or cyber uh, defense insurance, cost stays uh, plays a very big role in this. And um, what they would do, or your insurance would do, is they would look at what is the what is your risk factor now? So people who do not have any cyber um, insurance or cyber recovery 
plan or anything in place will have a very high risk factor, which means that, of course, your premiums will be very high and so on. But the more mature you become in trying to defend yourself and, and help, um, you know, stopping a cyber or having a cyber solution in place, the less your risk becomes. And I think at this stage, the financial impacts of this is the biggest. Um, mm -hmm. If you, you, but then again, you have to decide on where you're going to um, spend your money at the end of the day. Are you going to spend your money on very high premiums for insurance? And if you lose your data and the insurance companies pays out, they will never pay out the amount of money that you're going to lose in the, in the long run from the loss of business. Versus, do you? get everything in place as much as you can for a proper cyber recovery solution, then your premiums becomes more like a, a safety net at the bottom, which means that, yes, I have my uh, separated proper vault in place. I can recover my data, but if there's something that I'm not able to recover, then I can get the insurance to cover those shortfalls. And I think at the end of the day, the insurance, it's, it's a financial implication, and that's what it's about. Mm. Absolutely. I, I know from talking to, to folks who are, are in the, the cyber insurance, uh, the, in the, the insurance provider side of things, uh, that they obviously have to manage their, their own risk as well. And so there, there are a, t a ton of uh, qualifying criteria that need to be put in place and due diligence that needs to be, uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, and in the case of, of something like ransomware, uh, oftentimes it's very difficult to um, to demonstrate where deficiencies lay or, or what was actually at the, the root cause of the fault of an incident, which can, can be a factor as well. So yeah, for, for that reason, uh, it can be quite difficult to get cyber insurance for that in particular. Yeah, I think it also becomes a matter of trust at the end of the day. Like you said, what was the root of the breach? How did it come in? And if you start talking about what and who you can trust, not just inside, but outside of the organizations, then you're opening up a completely different can of worms. Mm. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, so here, let me bring you in here. There's a question that you answered in the chat and you raised some really interesting points that uh, kind of hint that there's a lot a lot more that can be unpacked. Um, the question was, can you combine a, a single plan covering both, uh, both a DR plan and a, a cyber recovery plan? Um, I mean, that there's obviously Plans will vary a great deal from from one to the next, but there but there will be some uh, some operational uh, specific operational requirements to unpack. So do you want do you want to uh, go into that a little? Yeah, yeah sure. And, and Theo, thank you so much for for the question, right? And uh, just to elaborate a bit more on that, there. So if we have to take and and, and my background from this, I've been a customer for fifteen years uh, in uh, data protection specifically, and then into a vendor space. You know, to learning what cyber resilience is. So I talk very much from a customer side. So if you talk about daily operations, everything from a daily operations perspective is your BCP, your uh, business continuity. Uh, that would be copy one, copy two, replication between your sites, failover between your sites. If there's an outage, how do we fail over? How do we fail back? And that would have its own governance and compliance around, we need to keep our data for an extra period of time, daily, weekly, monthly, and so forth. And with that there, you know, that's open to the network. It transverses between production and DR, and that is available all the time. When we talk about the isolated uh, disaster recovery or uh, a cyber recovery, we have to be very specific around what are our golden applications? What are those applications that will bring financial loss, reputational loss, uh, delays in operational activities, um, you know, that's, that's the key aspects of how do we bring this up? How do we stand up our environment as quick as possible in the least amount of time? And that vaulted environment must be disconnected from your daily operations. It has to have the ability of uh, securing your data and locking it down, uh, restricting access into this particular vault, irrespective of insider admin rights. Uh, it must have full, full auditable trace of who's accessing this vault and the reasons behind it. And then the data structures that you have with inside the vault would be for a shorter period. So you would have, uh, obviously with application owners and the business units say, remember, this is not just an infrastructure discussion. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a whole division discussion. It's all the way from governance, compliance, IT, uh, and the business application owners, and you're bringing it all together. So you would keep that data according to your governance compliance for a vaulted environment, seven days, 21 days, and 30 days, so that you can fall back within that period to bring data back. So bringing them together, you wouldn't take all your data that you have backing up today in your daily operations into a vault. 
uh, you would bring your critical applications to secure it, lock it down, and ensure that we can have a clean room to make sure we can stand up that data and we can actually present it out. So that's the differentiators between daily operations and the cycle farm. Right. Excellent. Thank you. And that, that last point you mentioned about the clean room environment to stand it back up again, uh, that, that's an area I think where there's been uh, quite a bit of attention in a lot, just in the last uh, couple of years where organizations are finding that their, their actual, their recovery processes were deficient. You know, the, um, the backups, were, the backups were taking place, but the actual recovery process itself was, was uh, fraught with difficulties. Um, uh, I would like to say that that's, that's improved, but I would, uh, um, I, I guess that's part of why we're having the conversation uh, today is, is that a lot of organizations may be still finding themselves coming, uh, falling short there. You know, you know, John, to that point, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to, as infrastructure, you know, how, how do we build this up? It's, it's a collaboration, right? It's, it's about bringing everything together and ensuring how do we stand that up and we hold each other accountable to make sure that this is, uh, everyone's aware that we can have a clean copy of your data. We know the data is clean. We're scanning our data continuously offline, not available to anybody. And then we can say for sure, in a cyber tech, we have our data of last night. It's all the critical applications. We're not ready to actually bring it up. And that's as simple as it gets. There's much more behind it, but we assist customers in consulting and understanding what are those applications? How do we bring it together? We have the security questions. We have the networking questions. We have the teams bring it brought together and how do we bring this together? So there's a lot of support that we provide in creating the cyber resilient vault. Excellent, thank you. So uh, there's a follow-up question here from uh, from Walter in, in the chat uh, and it uh, it almost links to uh, to a question that, uh, that Rudolf already answered. So the question is, uh, can we get a bit more information on, on the vault how you actually save data there. And the question that Rolf, that you answered around um, how an air gap actually functions and, and the use of technologies like data diodes to make sure that the, the transfer is, is only in one direction kind of feeds into that. Um, do you want to do you want to uh, talk a little bit about just the mechanics of, of how the vault functions, how customers inter, inter, uh, interface with it, how the, the, the actual data exchange functions? Okay, sure. The, the vault is a, let's call it a separate a separate rack that contains some um, infrastructure equipment in it. Um, one of those will be the storage that we stay, that we store our data on. Um, how it works is that the, the data is replicated from your primary backup copy into the vault, but this is not pushed from your production side. The data is actually replicated by initiating this replication from inside the vault. So as I said in my previous answer, you cannot initiate this replication or open this, or should I rather say close this air gap from outside everything is controlled from inside the vault um, yes we do make the use of di data diodes in certain circumstances because of the nature of the diode that it can only flow in one direction we will make use of data diodes when we want to set up alerting via emails or something like that because as we say we continuously scan the data inside the vault so if we do find something suspicious we need to notify someone about it and that's for those mechanisms that alerting and reporting that's where we'll use the, di the, the data diodes um, but yes, it is a replication function. It's a very efficient replication function. So it's not a, a complete copy of all the backups every single day. It will only copy the changes, but it is controlled from inside the vault. And that is the big difference. No one is supposed to get access to that from outside. It's always controlled inside this, let's call it a, yeah, inside this environment. Yeah. Hmm. Is, the, is there a, a specific, um, Compliance uh, or standard that uh, that technologies are are required to adhere to to, to guarantee that um, that the level of, of integrity is being maintained that that one way flow is uh, is um, is being upheld that the data is in fact uh, immutable. So is there are there you know, compliance or standards of stickers that customers should be looking out for specifically when they're looking at solutions? I think one of the most important ones is once you get that copy inside the vault, you should be able to lock that data, uh, create an immutable copy of it, um, so that you can guarantee that once it's inside your vault, whether it's infected or not, that that data has not changed at all. And uh, right. you must look at what, what is available out there. There are certain uh, compliance standards out there, international standards. Um, I can't remember the exact standard names, but I think one of them is called something like uh, 17 CFR 240 dash 
I don't know what the standard is. These okay. are, um, you know, like I said, it's an international standard that governs on how data should be locked so that it is immutable. And remember, there's two types of, of immutable copy or locking of data as well. There's a governance one, and then there's the, I can't remember the second one, but the one is easily deletable. As I hear, please jump in here. I cannot remember. That, that, that's, that, that's correct. That's uh, the compliance view also. Compliance. So uh, governance and compliance view. So ensuring that, uh, you know, admin rights do not have the ability to manipulate or change data. Uh, it will actually use the multi-factor authentication together with uh, security admin and backup admin. They will need security postures or passwords to actually do anything within this data within CyberVault. And, and, and to your point, John, just to add on to what Rudolf is saying, you know, you, you, you need to have immutable, uh, your immutable copy, but it goes a bit further where you have to have that data indestructible, right? And you must be able, like Rudolf said, in, infected or, uh, or not, you must be able to take that data and then push it onto machine learning to scan that data, not just metadata scans, full content scans of the head, the tail, and the data structures in between to ensure that nothing has changed and nothing has slipped through the cracks or, you know, in the op daily operations. So that would be immutability, indestructibility, and the machine learning and AI in an offline copy to ensure that data is 100% clean so that you can present it out to management and IT directors that the data is ready for uh, if the attack has to occur. Gotcha. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the follow-up question that came through in the chat is, yeah, how do you how do you do that scanning on the data um, in such a way that uh, there is no risk of uh, of contaminating the data in in turn? And, and I guess the, again, there's the two requirements there. The one is uh, from a um, from a data integrity point of view to make sure that the data is, uh, is immutable, but also from that compliance point of view, so you can guarantee that whatever scanning has been done after the fact, um, nothing has been changed in the in the underlying data. Um, uh, Rudolf, can I turn this to you, to you first? How do you, um, uh, what, what, sort of, what sort of scanning capabilities uh, do you have um, and, and what assurance uh, comes back to the customer that, that no data has been altered in the process? Um, yeah, if you remember one of the, the essential building blocks of creating a vault is I said that you must create an environment where the, the malware cannot actually execute inside. So the tools that we use to scan this backup data does not restore or extract the data from the golden copy at all. It actually reads this immutable copy that cannot be changed at any, you know, it can, it's impossible to change it once it's locked, but it actually reads it in the original backup data format. So there's no extraction or manipulating of the data happening. It is happening out of that original format. And that's the way that we can guarantee that nothing changes while we're, while we're actually scanning the data. It may be worth talking briefly about the scanning technologies that are in place. You guys have both hinted at, um, at machine learning and AI at, at technologies that are, in, that are in place to, um, to do the advanced scanning. You know, clearly we've, we've moved on some way from traditional signature-based um, sort of antivirus scanning and malware scanning. Um, give, give us a, a quick sense, if you can, of, of the types of um, the types of characteristics that you, you're able to scan for in data and the sort of uh, the sort of reporting that can come back. Okay, so what this tool does is it actually looks at a whole lot of um, let's call it categories that it scans throughout the data, and then it assigns a score out of 100 for each one of these points that it is looking at. So I think the easiest way for me to explain it is if you create a blank Word document and you would scan this with our tool, it will see that it is a Word document. It doesn't only look at the extension or anything like that. It scans the metadata, it scans the headers, it scans, it does a proper scan of all of this data and then assign these scores in all of these categories. So a blank, clean Word document will score, let's say 80 out of 100 points. So next time you start working on this document, you start typing some text in it and the next scan it runs again, it sees that yes, there's been changes in this document, but the changes are what is expected. And this is where the artificial intelligence and the machine learning comes in. Every time it scans it, as you work on this document, the score changes. But because it's a clean file, still it's a good copy of the file, even though you, you're growing the file through the work that you're doing, the score will change from let's say 80 to 82 out of 100. Now an attacker has gained access to the environment. It starts encrypting the files. And the first thing that will do is it will encrypt the file and it will change the extension of the file. As we do our next scan of this, it's immediately picked up. So our scoring out of 100 now jumps from 82 to 97. And that is how the system now knows that, listen, 
there's a possibility of something wrong here and it will alert you to that. And as I say, there's a whole lot of categories of the file and the data that we're actually scanning during this process. And presumably those characteristics evolve over time as, yeah, as yes. we find new, new types of attacks that are, are taking place. Um, yeah, one of the points that, uh, that may be worth just putting on the table is that with, uh, with malware as a service, ransomware as a service, uh, it, it's really essential to be on top of, uh, of those, those behavioral characteristics of what's happening to, uh, to files and data. Um, you may pay one ransom only to find that you're, uh, you're immediately facing another one. You know, the, the exploit that one attacker uses may well be exploited by another. Um, and since, the, uh, since these capabilities are being delivered as, as a service, um, it can happen awfully fast. So yeah, that, that constant evolution, super important. Uh, so gents, we are nearly out of time. Um, so I'd like to wrap up, if I may, with a, a question that I'll direct to, to both of you. And so here, I'll start with you and then, uh, and then Rudolf, I'll give you the last word. Um, and I'll just ask you to, to summarize what you think uh, businesses should be looking at when it comes to crafting their expectations for, uh, for data recovery and incident recovery uh, that we've been talking about. What are the you know, what are the key what are the key outcomes what are the key, what are the the gaps the, uh, that may be in place right now? Um, you know, we know this is very much front of mind. We've seen that from the uh, from the the survey data that we collect. Um, where are the you know, where are the the big um, the big areas for improvement in the uh, in the near term that uh, everyone on this call uh, should be looking out for? Sure, sure thing. Uh, thanks, Rob. So I, I think the first thing that comes back to mind, so when I speak to customers, a lot of it, and if you look at the attacks that actually occurred, um, there's multi-vendors involved when, when you have, you know, software, hardware, and everything in between, right? And when we talk from a cyber, a cyber ball perspective, uh, go with a, a vendor that has end-to-end, -end, they can talk to multiple backup technologies or backup softwares, but have a vaulted environment that has everything embedded into one vendor, because that is a, a different way of thinking uh, what data should transverse and how, so holding each other accountable, making sure the infrastructure is there. There's no finger pointing at, you know, vendor A versus vendor B versus vendor C. A single vendor strategy should be considered when you're looking at the vaulted environment. We can talk to other backup technologies, no problem. But when it comes to a vault, you want to keep that data intact, ensure that the data is uh, brought in at a quick pace, uh, that it's locked down, and that uh, it has a full scan to provide that ability of having that clean copy available. So I would say single vendor ability of having infrastructure can stand up very quick and can give you that outputs of clean data. Mm. Yeah, don't, don't compromise oh. it is, it is absolutely a, a key point there. Sorry. It, uh, well, thank you. Um, so, uh, Rudolf, uh, I'll turn it over to you then to uh, to answer uh, uh, basically the same the same question. What do, what do you think is driving the um, the expectations of uh, of security and re and recovery capabilities within uh, within it, within enterprises, uh, and what are, yeah the the key steps that need to be taken to uh, to shape and meet those expectations. No, I, look, I agree 100% as I hear a single vendor um, being able to guarantee that your data is clean and you can quickly stand it up is very important. But I think another thing that a lot of people out there keep forgetting is what exactly do we put in this vault? Um, the days are over of just saying, now nah, let's just take everything and replicate it into vault. There's a lot of thought that needs goes into, and there's a lot of consulting actually going into this as well. You, your customer, as a customer, you must put yourself in a position where you must think, if I need to stand up my business right now from absolutely nothing, what do I need to recover first? What is my VIP data? And I'm not talking about your main database containing all of your financial transactions and things like that. I'm talking about you need to get your environment going. So you need to start building, well, first, maybe your VMware infrastructure. Then you need to start standing up all the virtual machines so that you can get your Active Directory going again, so that you can actually have users logging in. But talking about users, what about your physical security at your document, at, at your building? There's a lot of systems that controls turnstiles at the gates and so on that's actually also part of the IT function. We need access to that as well. We need to get HR involved. We need to get the people involved who needs to um, report to governing bodies out there that there has been a breach in your company. 
once you've got all of those steps in place and you actually start building up your, your system from scratch, that whole putting yourself in that seat in imagining what is next, that whole consultation and the thinking around that will then in the end tell you what is really necessary to put in my vault so that I can get going again from a business. And there's certain stuff in your environment out there that we don't need to recover immediately, which we then can take longer to recover, but at least we can get the, the business up and going again. So yes, the whole process of thinking, start from zero trust, not having anything in your environment and picture yourself going the steps and building your environment again. Excellent, Rudolf. Uh, thanks so much, and Zahir, thank you as well for your insights. And thank you uh, to, to all of the delegates who, who posted questions, some really, uh, some really interesting questions there. So uh, thank you all uh, very much. So I'm gonna close now uh, just by sharing uh, a data point that came from the poll that you all took part in. Um, so 68% uh, um, of um, uh, of you, uh, uh, so big, big one, 78% 78, 78 uh, have conducted some form of, of DR exercise, um, but only 29% were confident that you'd re recover all of the data that was impacted. So uh, there is uh, absolutely, um, it's good to see a lot of the, um, the simulations being run, uh, but clearly, there are uh, there's there's always room for improvement there. So uh, thank you all for sharing the uh, sharing that uh, insights with us. So once again, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, we hope you've uh, we've learned from the discussions and uh, and of course we will share the content with you. Um, you'll be receiving a, a voucher courtesy of IDC as a token of our appreciation as well. Uh, so with that, uh, I will uh, wish you a, a very safe and healthy continuation of 2022. Uh, and thank you and goodbye.